Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. We're here at the Sandland Radio Observatory, our surplus geodesic radome that we picked up from a former NATO base in Canada. We're working on doing some actual radio astronomy. I'm not going to be breaking any scientific ground here. I'm not going to be discovering aliens, but I do want to test out some equipment, test out the dome itself, and learn some things about our setup so that we can do maybe some more serious science in the future. So here we are using the tiniest radio telescope inside of the geodesic dome with all of the nice echo that we always get in here. This is my miniature radio telescope made from an old TV satellite dish and I'm controlling it with my CyberDeck computer here. So that is telling the dish to go through a range of azimuth and elevation positions, record signal strength at each position. Same as before, we're going to create a sky map looking through the dome. So the idea here is that the dome should not actually block radio waves. That is something that people frequently ask about. Will this structure make a radio telescope see differently than if it was just outside with no obstructions? Well, the dome is supposed to be designed to minimize radio interference. The triangle arrangement is semi-random. These are not all exactly the same triangles and the material is aluminum and then fiberglass that's supposed to be less radio reflective than other materials. Now will that work in practice? That's what we're trying to find out. We are going to compare this scan run from the center of the dome with a scan that we ran with the exact same antenna, the same computer outside on one of the picnic tables over here from basically the same location. Now, since this thing takes three hours to complete a full sky scan, I'm gonna leave it alone and go do something else for the rest of the day. Eventually, of course, we want to use a bigger reflector dish like one of these guys. These are some satellite dish parts that we got from the uh, observatory up in Carp, Ontario. And I am intending to get these reassembled, put one of them inside the dome, maybe you leave one outside as a static radio telescope. That'll have to wait for the spring because it's far too cold to set any concrete in the ground or set up any dishes right now. All right, it's been about three hours. I've been down in the tunnels at the main Sandland project. So uh, it's time to take a break, go back upstairs and see how the satellite dish is doing. Three hours and this thing is still going. Um, limitations with the firmware on the brain there mean that it has to stop for one second at each dish position. So it takes a long, long time to do a full sky survey. There's really no point in it aiming this high because it's aiming past the geostationary satellite belt right now. And that's mainly what I'm looking at is geostationary satellites. This thing is tuned to about 12 gigahertz. It's just looking at TV satellite transponders. So that's mostly what I'm going to see here as well as some reflections from trees and maybe the structure of the dome and whatnot. Um, but just for completeness, we're gonna let it continue, finish the scan at the default settings because that's what I used last time and I'd like to get as close a comparison as possible. All right, so here is the result for the people who asked, will the geodesic dome affect our radio telescope? Will the radio telescope see this geodesic pattern? Yes, it turns out it absolutely does. You can see the inside of the dome on the scan. We can still see through the dome and we can still see uh, TV satellites outside of the dome, but we're absolutely seeing the dome as well. That's actually kind of interesting. I'm gonna do one more scan in that direction away from the geostationary satellite belt. So we're going to see just what does the inside of the dome look like without satellites on the outside. So we're just going to be getting kind of passive radiation coming through the dome from the sun. I'm not gonna do the whole 180 degree azimuth, 60 degree elevation scan because that just takes too long. I'm gonna do a abbreviated uh, scan range that's gonna take more like an hour. All right, that scan is done. And uh, I'll just throw an overlay up over here because this is not the easiest thing to look at. The specks in the sky, I'm starting to think those are Starlink satellites going past. Those show up on all of my scans. Starlink uses KU band and it's, people complain about it wrecking astronomy and if that's what it is, it's kind of wrecking my radio astronomy. The blobby things down at the bottom are trees around the geodesic dome. And I'm kind of surprised I don't see as much of the dome structure in this scan. I can still see it for sure, but it's not as obvious as it was in the last scan. 
Well, this has been a very interesting and enlightening use of the miniature radio telescope and the geodesic dome here. So this will give me some things to think about when we're designing our eventual big uh, satellite dish or radio telescope that's going to go in here. All right, we're back home. I have poked around at the data a little bit, and I do have to apologize for the quality of this video. It was filmed on several cameras. I had camera issues. I didn't exactly have a plan for what I was doing, but I wanted to share the results of this scan inside and outside of the dome because I thought it was really interesting. So here are those two scans side by side looking at the exact same part of the geostationary satellite orbit, the Clark Belt. Here's a quick overlay of what that looks like from an astronomy website of all the satellites in geostationary orbit that are visible from Sandland. The ones that we see in the sky here in this arc are just the strongest television satellites because this little dish that I'm using is tuned for satellite TV. It's seeing TV satellites and the brightest ones are the strongest radio signals. Now this first overlay is without the dome. This is just running the scan from a picnic table at about the location of the dome. We see that nice arc of geostationary satellites. We're looking basically down on geostationary orbit from the northern hemisphere here. With the dome, we see the exact same arc, the exact same satellites, but we also see the inside of the dome structure. We can see the aluminum vertices. We can see all of the beams that make up the interior of the dome but we also see the satellites with about the same signal strength. It doesn't seem to have really affected the incoming signal. It has just added extra noise. I made another quick Python program to extract the maximum and average values from the raw data of both of these scans, threw that into a spreadsheet just to compare them, and the maximums are basically the same. I have not apparently lost much signal strength. The maximum signal strength that came into the dish for both scans was basically less than 1% difference. Now, the amount of average signal across the entire image, the entire heat map here, did have a larger difference, something like 8 or 9%. So I'm considering that to be the increase in noise, the overall increase in just kind of internal reflections, background noise, and interference that the dome is creating. So we're basically getting a 9% worse or noisier signal by running the scan inside the dome versus outside. Now that's not a huge difference. 9%, I can live with that. And the dome offers all kinds of other benefits like weather protection, wind protection, just a nicer space to work, and it looks really cool. So I'm willing to take a 9% loss in signal quality just to have a geodesic dome because this thing is awesome. Maybe that's not very scientific of me and maybe this whole video is not super scientific. Somebody out there might look at my data, they might look at my spreadsheet here and say I'm on a completely wrong track. I am mostly just looking at the pretty pictures of what I got out of the radio telescope and saying, hey, that's pretty cool. We can see right through the dome. We can still see satellites through the visually opaque structure. Radio waves pass right through it, and we are getting some noise from it, but it's really not affecting too much, at least to my intuition, to what I can see, and to my very amateur understanding of radio theory and radio astronomy. If you're wondering about the weird halos around each of the signals, that's essentially a radio lens flare. Again, that's just an artifact of my tiny, tiny dish here, and that is why I want to go with a larger dish. An 8-foot reflector, a 10-foot reflector would have a much narrower beam width, so essentially a higher resolution. I could make, create a higher resolution picture. I do still have to figure out the motor system, and that is an ongoing project on this channel that I've worked on in many, many videos. We're trying to figure out how do we move a big 10-foot reflector accurately less than a degree at a time, ideally. That's a work in progress. The little tailgater dish has all those motors built in because this is a professional commercial product that you buy to bring out camping. It's not designed for radio astronomy like I'm doing here, but it's fairly easy to modify. If you're interested in any of that, I will put links to the code that I developed for this down in the description. I hope this has been an interesting video for everybody. Stay tuned to see our future radio astronomy projects, future geodesic dome projects, and if you'd like to see what we've done in the past with any of that stuff, then feel free to go back and check out my prior videos on any of those topics. Thanks to everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. I actually stopped and bought another tailgater for $25 along the way because my garage is not full of enough of these things, so uh, apparently I hate free space in my garage, so now I have another one.